Hey, it's a Friday night, and so what do we do on Friday nights? We bring the brew guys on. Well, not every Friday, but maybe we should. Yeah, we like to bring the brewers on. We have kind of a mecca of brewers in, uh, in southern New England and in Rhode Island right now, and we have the foolproof brewery highlighted tonight. So another entrepreneurial story, another story of... Uh, you know, good product to, to sample and how you can and all that kind of stuff. So, hey, listen, you know, Jess and I were just kind of a little tired of talking to politicians in this very heavy political season. You don't mind that, do you? I didn't think so. Let's, uh, let's do the rundown. By the way, I'm Dan York. Nice to meet you. Appreciate you stopping by. I think we got some video of the president here, and I'm here, by the way, it's just my water bottle, excuse me. Uh, I, I, I think he might have been half in the bag today. I mean, I'm looking at this video thinking, maybe he's been to the foolproof brewery uh, this morning. We'll show it to you. Uh, Ralph Mollis got nailed by an attorney today. It cracked me up. I think you might laugh, too. You know, we've had these gubernatorial candidates getting after each other and the issues and running all these ads about stuff that's important. Eyewitness News did some profiles on them over the last week or so, and Jess has edited some of the nicer moments for all of the candidates, and we'll play that for you. I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, it's amazing if you don't put rules together uh, to screw a project up, how wonderful things go, I'll explain. This is incredible. I have one radio listener who emailed me the reason why that is happening. And uh, the World Cup's over on Sunday. And uh, I think I'll watch it. But I have some suggestions. If you haven't seen the show all week, you'll, I don't know, you may have a reaction to my suggestions, you soccer nuts out there. All right, let's uh, dig in and find out what's going on here. Suing the president. That's what we're doing now. The headline in uh, time.com, Boehner House will sue president over Obamacare employer mandate. Now, this is all about Obamacare. And as the laws were written and the thousands of pages were unread by most lawmakers who passed it, the president started to adjust, right? He'd, uh, he'd take the individual mandate away. Then he'd take the employer mandate away. Uh, John, John Boehner is, is suing, while others like Sarah Palin are calling for the impeachment of the president. Boehner has opted to sue over Obamacare. And what's ironic is that he's suing over something that the Republicans wanted to see happen, meaning a delay at least in at least one mandate. The president was giddy. Here's what CBS reported. The suit has to do with the president's executive order back in 2013, postponing the mandate in the Affordable Care Act that requires large employers to provide health insurance to their employees. Speaker Boehner says the president didn't have the authority to issue that postponement on his own and that only Congress can change the law. At a speech in Texas, the president wrote off the whole thing as a political stunt. Take a listen. You're going to sue me to do, for doing my job? I mean, think about that. You, you're going to use taxpayer money to sue me for doing my job <laughs> while, while you don't do your job. You know, the president has a tendency to become unpresidential. And I think he was unpresidential there. Is that a term? Non presidential? Unpresidential? It's like, you're going to sue me for doing my job. I mean, enough, Mr. President. Uh, keep your composure through this whole thing here, please. Uh, the truth is, is that your executive order habit is testing constitutional, you know, right and wrongs here. And again, the irony is that the GOP actually enjoyed the postponement of the mandate. They just don't like the way it happened because they didn't do it. By the way, I didn't put this in the rundown today, but speaking of presidential, do we need a White House commentary on LeBron James moving from the Miami Heat to the Cleveland Cavaliers? Like I said, didn't make the cut on the rundown today, but... You know, I would like the presidency to have a high bar. I don't need ESPN commentary out of the White House. Next item. Mollis motive question. I cracked up when I saw this today. Here was the uh, headline on WPRI.com or WPRO.com. Eh, same thing. Corso lawyer, not really. Changes by Mollis are political. All right, so this is all about 38 Studios, and this is all about the good work that Tim White did when he uncovered a contract from this one Michael Corso, the uh, 
like guy in the middle of organizing the whole 38 Studios debacle, right? We know that he was employed by 38 Studios. We know that he was friendly with the Speaker of the House. We know that he coordinated meetings with the Governor, the Speaker of the House. We know that the House of Representatives, at least, voted without really knowing what they were voting on to approve the money guarantees for the debt uh, sale, the bond sale for 38 Studios. We know all of that. And Tim comes up with this sourced contract that has Mr. Corso working on behalf of 38 Studios for $300,000 compensation to interact with government officials. Now, he put that under Ralph Mollis's nose, the Secretary of State. It took him a half a day, Mollis, to figure out, uh, gee, maybe I really ought to ask about whether this guy was a true lobbyist, a registered lobbyist. And so now, way late, dollar late, and, uh, you know, a, a dime, dime, a dollar, a, a, what is it, how is it? A, 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 dollar late and a day short. I don't know what the phrase is, but all I know is he's way late. And the lawyer for Mr. Corso, by the way, Corso didn't show up. The lawyer for Mr. Corso shows up and then talks to the press and knocks Mollis out. Watch this. We've read the articles in the paper. We've seen the media reports. As far as we're concerned, there isn't any doubt that this is a political issue and it has a lot to do with the fact that Mr. Mollis wants to be lieutenant governor and he's trying to figure out a way to make people think that he's actually doing his job as secretary of state. No, look, this guy's client has a lot to answer for, but he's absolutely right because the secretary of state running for lieutenant governor has no foundation here because this stuff was under his regulatory nose and he completely missed it. Now, did he miss it on purpose or not? By the way, it's a day late and a dollar short. I just figured that out. All right, next item here. Uh, Human side of the candidates. This is very touching. You've seen a lot of battle between the candidates for governor right now, but the uh, or up to this date. But the uh, the folks at Eyewitness News did, I think, a pretty cool job. Just highlighted some of their news packages and the lighter side of their their lives. What I've been through is what thousands of Rhode Islanders have also been through. So I don't wear that as a, as a, as a mark of shame at all. It's, it shows that, you know, I'm the fighter. I knew when I got into this race that politics would often get focused on, on side issues. For years, people were looking for President Obama's birth certificate. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, I do. Well, I, th I think you learn things al along the way. Her daughter has become her unofficial campaign manager. So the morning after my first debate, 6 o'clock in the morning, she comes running up, Mom, Mom. Why did you say this for this answer? Why didn't you say that for that answer? We're very excited about the news that Farrah Rose is going to be a big sister. Angel Tavares' wife, Farrah, five months pregnant, very excited about her growing family. I see that, you know, he's doing this for us. He's doing this for, you know, the city. He's doing this for the state, you know. He's doing this for everyone. Uh, my daughter is a, a political animal. In fact, Anna just ran for fourth grade student council. She won. And she came home that night to tell me about it. She told me that uh, she was the first block to hold elected office in Rhode Island. The first person in his family to graduate from college and law school, Fung's crowning achievement was landing at City Hall. The best moment for me, I'll never forget it. I have this etched in my mind, have my, both my mom and dad on my side, the family Bible is there, it's wearing it, and I just looked over and I see the pride in my parents' eyes as I got sworn in as mayor. It was pretty cool. That's good stuff. It just shows you the candidates are people too. Coming up next week, they get back to killing each other. It's the way it goes. Uh, next item here. This is uh, just so funny. Front page story of the Providence Journal today uh, talks about uh, more kids in the pool. And we've got video of the kids in the pool. There's also in the Davy Lopes pool, other city pools. You know, last year it was like, oh, we've got to close the city pool because, you know, there's not enough kids showing up. Well, it seems to me there's enough kids showing up. It's amazing. Last year they had rules that said you have to have a parent or guardian in order to go to the pool. Well, if those parent and guardians are working during a summer day, you know what? They're not going to have a parent or guardian bring them to the pool. So the new city commission came up with some ideas to, like, knock out the stupid rules, uh, lessen some restrictions, add some instruction, and guess what? We got more kids in the pool, and we got more kids learning to swim, which is a wonderful thing. It's amazing how that happens. It's progress, common sense progress. Amen to that. What doesn't make any common sense to me is that we don't have lifeguards. In Smithfield, there's a lifeguard shortage. One of the facilities there is, is uh, Sans lifeguards, and so they had to close it. The town beach closes due to lifeguard shortage. Only one of the ponds in Smithfield can operate because they need four or five lifeguards that they do not have. You know, I gotta tell you, as a former lifeguard, as a kid, I mean, I never had more fun 
in my life. I, you know, I'm 17, you don't really know how good it is. I knew how good it was when I was 17 and I was a lifeguard. There's no better way to make a summer buck. And I don't understand why this is happening out there, trying to figure out this generation. Then one of my listeners sent me an email on WPRO, you know, weekdays noon to 3. He said, Dan, the reason why we have a shortage of lifeguards is because you can't get your certification on an iPhone app. Must be. Changing generation in a world sometimes I don't get anymore. And finally, it's all over. No more World Cup jamming up my DVR. I get the competition and the intensity, and I've learned some things. Two recommendations. Stop the clock and move that penalty kick back 25 yards. And for those of you who are soccer fans and think I don't know what I'm talking about, sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about, but it makes sense to me. Full Proof Brewery. Friday night. I don't know if we're allowed to have a few, but we might. So we're pretty loose here on a Friday night, as I think you've gotten to know if you've been watching the show for any length of time. So, you know, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. Actually, it's 7.30 somewhere. So we're, you know, overdue for a Dan York Show beer, that's for sure. Uh, take a look at this nice little setup. Now, I don't, this, these are very nice cans. And now I can kind of bust them open here. And now that we've got the, uh, Nick is in here, president and founder of Full Proof Brewery. That's a pretty cool name. Thank you. Full yeah. Proof meaning? Well, you, if you look at our cans, you see there's a jester on them. Uh, the jester is the fool. It's kind of our company logo, our mascot. And the proof is the alcohol. You put them together, you get foolproof. Good positive message and kind of rolls off the, the tongue a little bit. Oh, the jester's on top. Okay, so what was the, what was the thinking? Who's, what was the brainstorm behind the whole concept? Well, you know, the jester's all about having a good time, having fun, and let's be honest, that's why people drink beer. So that's how we came up with the fool. And then, uh, like I said, the proof is the alcohol. Everybody I've ever met in the, in the brewery business comes to one concept, which is beer is fun, <laughs> and so we'll work really hard to put out a fun product. Cool. What's the... Um, you are right down the down the road from the the guys at Bucket Brewery. That's that right. I yeah. The, I went to one of their Friday night things where they had the, the band and all that kind of stuff going. And because I was over there, I said, "Hey, why don't you come on the TV show? Do you have the same kind of promotional stuff going on? With uh, we your do. Location we do uh, tours and tastings. Uh, we do Friday night tastings from five to seven. So those will start up in a little bit. Um, and then on Saturday we do uh, uh, tours. We get great crowds out every weekend. People love to come and see how beer is made. It's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Why is it fascinating to everybody? I think. It's just a lot of people aren't aware of uh, how complex beer is and what goes into it. I mean, we are a true manufacturing facility. If you come in, you see the large tanks. People aren't aware that we're up there. You know, we're, we're kind of tucked away in Pawtucket. Um, and, you know, we get a great crowd in. They get a glass. They get a tour of the brewery, a little overview of brewing, and, of course, drink some beer. So uh, it's a win-win for everyone. You have one of those deals where they get um, they can buy a certain amount. I mean, Rhode Island law limits how much you can take out of a, out of a brewery, They do, right? yes. So exactly. what's the maximum? That it's 72 ounces to take home. Okay. Um, um, and it, that's an option for people when they come out yes. of the tour? Yeah, if they come in for a tour. You've got a half a dozen employees or so that, that they're working full time? That's what, right, yeah. You're another one of these guys that decided to, what, flip careers? I mean, yes. you've been doing this for 18 months. What were you doing prior? Uh, I was in the uh, the aerospace industry, so you know, logical career transition yeah, into well, beer. Huh? <laughs> you're gonna have to you have to draw that line for me. Sure. Yeah. Well, happen? I uh, like most folks and in, in who get into uh, beer into into the brewing industry. Uh, brewing started as a hobby for me and spiraled into uh, an obsession, and decided, uh, hey, maybe this is something I can make a career out of. So. Here's what I can't figure out. Every brew guy that I've ever had on the show is thin. <laughs> How is that possible? Look at me. I am a pork chop. <laughs> and, and, and when I'm drinking too much beer, I go, I just start to, how do you do it, man? You like, you like run 10 miles a day? Because you must drink your, I mean, who's the guy from um, Sam Adams? Jim Cook. I had him on the show one day. He brings a suitcase of beer in. <laughs> he tells me he drinks every day. To sample his product. Yeah, it's the part of the never, job. The guy, the guy doesn't have a smile off, <laughs> off his. How much beer do you have to drink to run a brewery? You know, it depends. Uh, you, well, the, it, people kind of laugh, but drinking beer is, is is very important from a quality control standpoint. So you know, we're always sampling the beer in the tanks. Got to taste. You can't got to taste it. Uh, you know, I'm out in bars two or three, sometimes four nights a week doing promotional events. So you're drinking beer then, drinking beer at home. So. Uh, you know, we do it, obviously, responsibly. Uh, but, you know, yes. drinking beer is part of the job, occupational hazard. All right. So answer the question. How do you remain 
uh, healthy and thin. It's just you—you got the right metabolism. It's or the you're stress. I don't sleep at night. You know, no. worrying about all the business factors. <laughs> so they how, kind of balance each other. How out. is business? Very good. Very good. Yeah, well, this is uh, prime season for beer sales. Right. No surprise. Warm weather's here. People are on the beaches, out on the golf course. Um, you know, and, and our beers in cans, as you as you notice, which uh, tend to sell a little bit better in the summer months. No so. bottles. Uh, we do a very small amount of bottled beer, but uh, the bulk is in cans and kegs for us. For a reason being? Well, cans are actually really good for beer. Uh, a lot of that surprises some people when they hear it, but uh, cans actually block out sunlight, and they have a very small amount of oxygen in the can, and, and oxygen degrades uh, the shelf life of beer. So um, they're lightweight, too. They're recyclable. So beer stays better in a can than it does in a bottle? Uh, yeah, technically, from a scientific standpoint. It really? Mm -hmm. Huh. All right, so you got a whole bunch of makes and models here. When we come back, we'll just have to... Explain what the product is. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Stay with us. I'm thinking everyone should just get together over a beer, preferably a foolproof, and work everything out. But uh, that's how I would do it, I guess. It was a while back when you were trying to, what, get a new label and you need government approval to get a label? I didn't realize you need government approval to get a label for a beer can. You do, yeah. Any, uh, any kind of alco alcoholic beverage you need and a the label. government stoppage was going on, so you were saying, hey, just everyone you know, had a few beers and then try to figure this whole thing I out. I wish it had been that easy. But yeah. it did work out. We got that beer out in time. That was our Russian Imperial Stout. All right. Nick Garrison is my guest here. He is the, uh, the president and founder of Foolproof uh, Brewing Company. I, I love these entrepreneurs that, that have the, the gumption and the guts to just you know, step up and build a new business and do something that they love. And, and the beer thing is always phenomenal. And, and you guys are really cool with your themes. Now, we, we showed you some of the cans. I don't know if you, you're not going to be able to see this, but this is India. I'm an IPA guy. Nice. You know, I, kind of into, but this is called the, the Backyard YAHD. And now, this is 6%. So the average non-light beer is about four and a half, five percent. Yeah, around there. Right? So a six percent beer, da but a boom, but a boom, right? You've got a four and a half percent here, the bar stool. There's a theme behind all of these beers. That's right, right yeah. What does the bar stool taste like and what's the theme? Uh, so all of our beers are paired with an experience in life, an activity where you might find yourself drinking a beer. And so we, we think about that experience when we actually brew the beer. So Bar stool, as the name implies, it's like the perfect beer for drinking with your friends at a bar, sitting on a bar stool. A little Maybe lighter. A little bit lighter, a little bit lower in alcohol, so you can have a few of them and okay. uh, not fall off the bar stool. Right, so. and drive home okay. <laughs> uh, but then it gets a little crazy here. The uh, the robust porter called Rain Cloud, late Rain Cloud. Yes. Well, what's that all about? That is our rainy day beer, uh, six and a half percent alcohol, delicious dark porter. Um, it is our bad weather beer. For lack of a better term, and uh, we sold a lot of it this winter. Really? And is the customer feedback that they get what you're saying, that they feel the same way about it? I think so, because anyone who's ever enjoyed a beer, you know, sitting on a beach or at a bar with friends or, you know, watching a baseball game, you know, if you think about beer drinking as an experience and something that brings friends and family together, uh, I think it's an, it's an idea, it's a concept that any beer lover can get behind. That's really cool. All right, so, and then there's the Farmhouse Ale, La what is that? <laughs> we call it LFU. It's uh, it's French for the urban farm. You better say that slowly, not so fast. <laughs> I, you know, okay, we're still FCC approved here. Uh, the farmhouse sale, seven point eight percent. Yeah. Oh, oh. And that's our post work day beer. Like stay on the farm, <laughs> away from the tractor. That's right. Right. And what does this what does this taste like? Uh, that is a very unique beer. It's a Belgian style ale, uh, and actually, arguably our most popular beer at the moment. Really? Um, okay. And it's uh, very easy drinking. The Imperial Pale. India Pale Ale, the king of the yard. This is the this is the blow your doors off stuff, right? <laughs> nine and a half percent by alcohol. That's nine point five. That's the big brother of the regular backyard. So if you're really into hops, into a uh, you know a nice aromatic bitter beer, uh, you definitely want to check that one. out. Is this out. the one you say you're you're taking home, oh, Jess? The whole, you, oh, she's got the she's got the dibs. And then <laughs> and then uh, the backyard. And so this is. This is really neat that you've got these themes. Is this the total product line at this point? Uh, we do have that the Russian Imperial Stout I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the label uh, situation. Uh, that only comes out in the winter, though, and that's called Reverie, and that's actually a 10.7 percent. Wow. Yeah. So what's the moral of the story so far? 18 months in, uh, you're, you're, are people buying this on the tap uh, as well at the bars? That's the big goal, right? You've got to get it in the bars so that they're drinking it recreationally when they're out. Where's the? I mean, you get in the liquor stores as yep. much as you can, trying to get some shelf space. That's not easy, right? No. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, we do about about 35 percent of our business in uh, bars, and then the remain, remainder in liquor stores. And we're in three states: Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Uh, no surprise, Rhode Island is our our biggest market by volume, right. and we've shipped to uh, almost 1,500 accounts. You, today. It's fun. You got to create a market. 
it's rubbing two sticks together, isn't it? You got to create a market need. You want people, customers to say, "Hey, don't you carry this? You should carry this." Put yep. the pressure on either the liquor stores or the or the bars and restaurants. Um, it's an interesting marketing grind, isn't it? It's a very tough industry. People don't realize you know, how much goes into it. And, and you know, the first step is putting out the best beer you can. You know, and uh, that's what we do. And uh, we try to tell a story with our, our brand, uh, you know, get people excited about Foolproof. And uh, you put those factors together, and we have a great team. We're going to be in another 18 months or three, four years. What do you think? Uh, you know, we, we uh, have aspirations to grow into a national and eventually an international brewery. Uh, we want Foolproof to be a, a household name around New England and other parts of the U.S. It's catchy. It's catchy. Foolproof. I mean, it's, 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 and I like the themes. I think you got a lot going on. Thanks. I'll have to taste it after the show. This way, I don't get jammed up and get a memo, that kind of thing. Congratulations Thanks, on everything, Dan. and uh, keep in touch with us so we Absolutely. know what's going on. Absolutely. Come by the brewery sometime. Well, it's not come by. You know, it's not <laughs> like it's lifting. It's not heavy lifting to stop by and, and do a tour. All right, your state of mind when we come back. Stay with us. By the way, uh, you can go to Foolproof. Uh, what was the What was the website? Foolproof. Full, 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 you know, foolproofbrewing.com and uh, find out all the information about the tours and the like. Uh, your state of mind, 228-1886, or you can email or Facebook post or tweet at me. And here's one. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I know. I know. Federer's from Switzerland. Last night I embarrassed myself. We're talking about American tennis players. This is what I, this is, just wants me to embarrass myself. I was, you're not going to run that to me from yesterday? I'm out of time. I know he's not American. Sampras is the American. I'll see you Monday. It's been a long week. I'm going to have a couple of beers tonight.